Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about how to self-treat an elevated first rib. Now, if you have this issue, or you're just generally interested in what we're talking about by an elevated first rib, you'll hopefully have a really strong appreciation by the end of this video, how that first rib can be a really strong central piece of dysfunction that can set you up for neck pain or neck dysfunction and shoulder pain or shoulder dysfunction. Um, there's a really strong sort of correlation between an elevated first rib and some thoracic outlet syndrome or some symptoms that sort of shoot down the arm, pins and needles tingling and all those sorts of things. But the bigger, I guess, overarching idea in this video is I want to show you guys one really effective and fast acting exercise to restore normal function to that first rib and obviously help with neck pain, help with shoulder pain, any thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, any symptoms that are going on in that area. Um, hopefully this, this exercise will really help sort of uh, push you through that dysfunction really quickly. Um, on top of that, by the end of the video, I want to make sure that you have a really strong appreciation of how that first rib becomes dysfunctional in the first place. So if you're taking the time to treat that elevated first rib, you also need to have a really strong appreciation of why that happened in the first place and rectify those things so that this first rib doesn't become dysfunctional again down the track. So we want to pair up a really good exercise with potentially getting to the source of that dysfunction. And then I also want to talk about a really common misconception about an elevated first rib, which may actually change your entire perspective of what it is, uh, but it's based on what we sort of find clinically. So um, I find a lot that sometimes some of the general terminology that's used like an elevated first rib may actually be slightly different to what's actually going on. And again, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of trying to, I guess, solve your elevated first rib and any associated dysfunction. But um, it's really good to have that perspective, just so you know exactly what you're dealing with. Because when we tie in how it happens with what it is, there's potentially a little bit of a disconnect um, in terms of what's going on there. It's only semantics, but it's just good to get that broader understanding so that you can make sure that it doesn't come back again in the future. So, so before we get into it, as always, if you go on to enjoy the video, if you find it useful, um, please leave a like down below. Uh, and please consider subscribing to the channel. If you're new, it really helps these videos get out to more people. Um, we're really trying to sort of put these out to sort of fill in some gaps that might be in the medical industry at the moment, update a few sort of old school ideas, give you guys some extra ideas that you may not have, be, uh, you may not have got from your physical therapists or from your health professionals, from your doctors, uh, some information that we deal in clinically that seems to work really well. So um, if you can subscribe to the channel, then you'll sort of get that information as it comes out. Um, and then before we get into the exercises, let me know in the comments below, you know, what's brought you to find this video? You know, do you have some neck pain? Do you have some shoulder pain? Has someone just said that you've got an elevated first rib? Let me know down below. So we just get a bit of an understanding about what sort of what's brought you here and that it helps this advice become more specific down the track. So I really appreciate that. So, um, so that being said, um, let's get into the exercise. So, so as a lot of people uh, may or may not realize, that first rib is actually quite high in the upper back. Now, if you find your collarbone at the front, so mine's just here, the first rib is actually right at the top, right at the base of your neck where it meets that shoulder, um, just underneath where those upper traps are that a lot of people know about. Um, so it's quite high up in the upper back. It's a lot higher than a lot of people expect, even though it makes perfect sense when you're made aware of it. So when we're trying to solve this dysfunction, we need to make sure that we're above the level of the collarbone and we're looking for things that shouldn't be there essentially. So, so the idea with an elevated first rib that we currently sort of run with is that the muscles become tight, it sort of pulls that rib up and there's a bunch of nerves um, on one side of things, there's a bunch of nerves that come from the neck that go between the sort of the top of the rib cage and the collarbone and the nerves go to your armpit and travel down your arm. So if you have some thoracic outlet uh, symptoms, often we sort of see that this rib is lifted up sort of compressing the nerves a little bit more than it should, creating this neural dysfunction down the arm. So we're sort of looking at it where that rib's elevated or essentially it's dysfunctionally um, functioning, that's proper English, um, and it's causing some havoc. So a great way to check this out on yourself to see what your first rib is doing, even if you don't have any major pain, is to combine a few movements to see. So if you turn your head to one side and just get a sense of how you feel when you do this, most people won't feel too much, but if you feel a little bit of a jamming feeling or a pinching feeling or a blocking feeling uh, compared to the other side, take note of that. If you then lift your shoulder up and you feel some stiffness or some tightness in that area on the same side that you've turned to, 
then there's every chance that there's a little bit of rib dysfunction at the top there where that rib isn't sliding and gliding and getting out the way when your shoulder lifts up and when you're twisting your head, it's not sort of rotating or allowing that rotation to occur and it can cause a bit of a jamming. So generally, if you're looking to one side and you feel something and you lift your arm up and you feel something, uh, that's connected. If you feel like you turn the other direction uh, and that gives you something or you feel on the other side and the opposite arm uh, feels a bit stiff and tight as well, then it may not be your first rib. But having said that, if we do this exercise by using a tennis ball or lacrosse ball, then we can figure it out for certain because we can treat it. And if you see an amazing difference, then you know what you've done, you know what you've changed and you don't have to guess. So we've done a variation of this exercise a lot on the channel. So it's nothing new to a lot of people, but it's a very versatile exercise in terms of the, the, um, the areas and the places you can put it and the effect that you can have. So, so what I always suggest before doing any exercise is get a baseline reading first. So as we went through a second ago, turn your head to one side or turn your head to both sides, get a sense for how it moves and how it feels and lift up the arm that you're going to mobilize that on the side of the first rib you're gonna mobilize. Just get a sense of how that feels. So for me, if you take note of how far it looks like I can get to, so if it's a little bit tight there for me, take note of sort of what part of the face of mine you can see. And then as I lift my arm up, I've got decent shoulder range of motion, but just take note of this gap or what this sort of shape looks like here. Because if the rib's a bit stiff, you might find I'll be able to close that gap a little bit better after doing the exercise. So, so as I said, all you need is a tennis ball or a cross ball. Uh, you, want, you want something that feels like it has a density that you feel very comfortable pressing into your back. Um, if it's too hard, it might be painful. If it's too soft, it may not do something. But you'll know as soon as you put the ball in there. And you can do this sitting up against a wall like I'm about to do, or you can do it lying down on the floor. It's completely up to you. So all we want to do here is, as I said, that first rib is literally at the base of the neck as it attaches into the shoulder, just underneath those upper traps. It's not a lot sort of lower than you expect. There might be other ribs below that that are a little bit dysfunctional. Um, you can certainly put some pressure on it as well if you want to, but we'll just start with the very top to begin with. So, so what we want to basically do is, if you can find the bump that sticks out at the base of your neck, it's generally the last level of your neck before it gets to the upper back, before it gets to the rib cage. So if you place the ball on that big bump at the base, drop it down a little bit, and then let it roll out to the side, just off the spine, what you'll find is you'll be on the first spinal level of your thoracic spine. So you'll be on T1. Now that level is important because the first rib attaches into the side of that. So, so I had the ball on the bump at the base of my neck. I've moved down the level to the next bump. I've moved just across onto the spinal joint. And now what I want to do, I want to hit the rib as it comes out a little bit further. So essentially you might see the ball uh, at the top here. You can see that at all. Um, but you want to make sure that you roll the ball out far enough and you'll know as soon as you hit it, it'll feel like a really stiff, maybe tender, um, thick restriction. It, it might be, so it might feel like there's some muscle spasm over the top. Uh, but fun fact, if you have knots in your upper traps, it's not a muscular problem specifically. All those muscles are doing are reacting and trying to protect and support uh, rib dysfunction underneath that. So if you feel like you're getting all these sort of knots at the top of your shoulder, um, as it goes into your neck, you might find that underneath that there's some rib dysfunction that you can change with this exercise and you might find that muscular tightness will go away very quickly. So, so basically, um, I'm sort of right at the top, just about to creep over the top of my shoulder here. Now, I've found some real stiffness here. I can move the ball out to the side a little bit or back in a little bit just to try and find where the best feeling of tightness is for me. Now, depending on how sore this feels for you, I'll just get you to stay here if you want to. Now, if you're doing this on the ground, you might need to lift your bottom off the ground and instead of being flat on the floor, you might need to lift it up just to angle the ball sort of more onto the top of the shoulder just to feel like you're getting, you're getting a good purchase on the ball. But for the purposes of this, it's literally, I don't know if you can see this, but it's literally just there. Um, and I'm, I've got it on a spot that feels a little bit stiff. So again, depending on how tight and sore it feels for you, just let the ball press in. You don't have to roll it around. It's not a rolling exercise. It's just a pressure exercise. We're trying to locate the areas that feel stiff, tight, and possibly tender. And we're letting the ball sink in and sort of um, separate and sort of de-rust some of that stiffness in the joints, particularly the rib joints. Now, if you're feeling pretty comfortable here and you want to ramp it up a little bit, we can get your arm involved. So again, as we've done on the channel before, we can use movements to shear free some stiffness and tightness in that rib cage. Now, 
if you may have noticed before, when I did it on my left hand side, I pretty much got all the way up, no problems. But as soon as I stick a ball into that rib and block that rib, stop it from moving, all of a sudden I feel like I can only get maybe two thirds of the way up there. So I'm a fair way from the wall here. But what I want to do is I want to oscillate in and out of that range. I want to use the, the, the movement at my glenohumeral joint, my shoulder joint, to shear free some of the stiffness and the tightness at this rib. Um, and what you should hopefully find in a very short amount of time, that arm will start to move further and further and further. And for me, uh, I'm not far off being able to touch the wall just after a few seconds of, of doing this. So to start with, I was here, which you can't really see too much from front on, but now I feel like I've gained this extra range of motion just by shearing free that first rib. Now, as I said before, once you've done that, you can do that for a few minutes. You can move up or down or left or right. You can go down as low as you feel you need to. It's unlikely that that first rib is just the only rib that's stiff and tight and dysfunctional on its own. You're probably going to find there's a whole bunch of ribs, the second, the third, the fourth, uh, all the way down there that's also stiff. So just sort of put the ball down lower and lower, searching for what you find. Then once you've done that, just reassess your movement again. And I don't know if you can see this on me, but it feels like it travels further. So you might find that maybe my nose goes around further than it did before. Feel free to rewind the tape to find out. But then again, when we come back to this shoulder movement, automatically it feels like this arm is a lot closer to my head and my ear than it was before. I was out here before because this first rib was blocking my ability to get my arm into, uh, into a really upright position. But now that I've freed that up, I've got all this extra range of motion to play with. And by taking away that stiffness in that first rib, I've been able to restore a lot more normal function to my shoulder and my neck than what I had before. So if it's a really important feature of your neck pain or shoulder pain, then trying to free up that upper back stiffness in that rib and that first rib and anything around that obviously um, can be a really sneaky way to feed some, some slack and some function into those dysfunctional areas and restore some normality and hopefully help your pain and dysfunction. So, so that is by far one of the best exercises I've ever seen to sort of quickly restore and normalize that first rib function. So now we want to talk about why it happens and what the common misconception is about an elevated first rib. So the, I guess these next two points tie in together. So we'll sort of talk about them at the same time. So, so one of the things I sort of want to raise with an elevated first rib is actually whether that rib is elevated at all. Now, the, the common conception or the, the idea surrounding that first rib is that the muscles get tight they sort of pull that rib up and then it can compress some of the tissue, block other tissue from moving and cause dysfunction. But the main cause of that first rib dysfunction is actually poor shoulder postures. So what we often see with a lot of people is this default shape that we all tend to get into when we're not paying attention. If you're on the mouse, for example, and that, that arm sort of drops and rolls forwards, what tends to happen is all the muscles that attach from your shoulder into your neck and into your upper back all of a sudden come under constant tension just from the weight of your arm being in this position. So if you're, if you're at your computer a lot, if you're uh, on your phone a lot, if you're sort of, um, you know, if you're one of those people who sort of drives in a position that sort of gets you sucked into a, a dropped shoulder position, which is constantly hanging off that first rib, the second rib, all the tissues into the neck. And over time, so it doesn't happen first time, probably not the second time, probably not the 10th time, but as those times stack up, if it's a routine position that we're in, those tissues are forced to stiffen and tighten to cope with that load that's going through there, that abnormal loading of the neck, the first rib and the shoulder. Uh, and then as a consequence, it gets tight and stiff. And the reason why I wanna sort of challenge that common conception about an elevated first rib is because we're always in this position, it actually makes more sense that that first rib gets depressed because it's always been pulled down and forwards so as opposed to that rib being elevated and causing problems, it's far more likely that that rib is going to be dropping down and forwards because that's the way that the tissue goes and we get into a bad shape. And you don't see too many people walking around like this. You see uh, almost everyone at all times in, in sort of this sort of rounded position um, without really thinking about it too much. So, so the point I wanted to make here is as I said right at the start of the video, whether it's elevated or not, probably doesn't matter too much because if you can find that stiffness and tightness, restore normal motion to it, and then just put it in a better position by taking your shoulders sort of back and up a little bit, so not abnormally up, but just sort of backing up a fraction so you're supporting the weight of those shoulders, 
what we see clinically is that first rib dysfunction stops coming back. It stays loose, it stays strong, and it stays well positioned because you're putting it in a good position day to day. So if you have any neck pain, any shoulder pain, any thoracic outlet symptoms or anything related to that, and you're not freeing up that first rib and putting it in a better position by being conscious of maybe the less than perfect shapes you're putting it in, then it can be very hard to solve it long term. You can certainly make strong progress in the short term, but if you're not necessarily addressing the root underlying cause of that, then obviously it makes sense that there's no guarantee that it won't come back again or that your symptoms will completely resolve and go away. So what we know is if you put your tissue in a good position and there's nothing too sort of damaged in terms of the natural anatomy there, there's every reason you deserve to feel good long term as long as you're putting it in a better position and away from that sort of less than ideal position. So, so I just wanted to touch on that quickly because again, I'm a big advocate of making sure that we have some solutions here, that we talk about an exercise that genuinely works but we're also having an adult conversation about what's potentially caused that dysfunction to be there. And from what I see clinically, I haven't seen too many elevated first ribs. I do see a hell of a lot of depressed and anteriorly sort of rolling forward first ribs. But at the end of the day, that rib's dysfunctional. It becomes stiff because of the load that we're putting into it. So uh, I think it's really important to just make that distinction. Let me know in the comments below if you see otherwise. Again, this is an adult conversation. So we want to make sure that we're sort of evolving based on the information that we see. Uh, but as we said at the moment, there's potentially a slight misconception there that may not necessarily matter. It's probably semantics, but but the, the exercises and the root cause are very, very strong. So, uh, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, as I said before, please leave a like if you did find it helpful. Consider subscribing if you like this information and you, want, you sort of want to keep evolving your body, improving it and conquering your aches and pains. So, uh, so until next time, appreciate you watching and uh, we'll see you then.